Hi everyone, welcome back to another weekly update on all things AI and education. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to our newsletter where we share these updates and write blog posts on everything happening in the ecosystem. And if you're around in San Diego in April, would love to see you all at our upcoming AI show and ASU GSV in a short few weeks. This week, there's been a ton of recent updates in the model world, particularly around all the noise surrounding Grok 3, which is the LLM coming out of Elon Musk's XAI lab, also kind of known as a challenger to other big frontier AI model labs like OpenAI and Anthropic. So what's special about Grok is that it was trained at their Colossus supercluster in Memphis, Tennessee, which used about 100,000 NVIDIA H100 GPUs, and it was completed in just 19 days, which is a pretty short amount of time in model training world. Grok is also maximally truth-seeking, meaning that it prioritizes truth over political correctness. Compared to other AI models, you can ask the same prompt, and it won't come up with the same guardrails or not allow you to query certain topics. Grok 3 is actually a family of models, so it has Grok 3, Grok 3 Mini, Think of these as kind of on par with GPT-40. And then you have reasoning models like Grok3 Reasoning and Grok3 Mini Reasoning. These are more similar to OpenAI's O3 or DeepSeek R1, meaning that they take more time to think and reason and are better suited for more complex tasks. According to XAI, on benchmarks, Grok outperforms DeepSeek V3 and Claude 3.5 Sonnet. However, early feedback from people like Andre Karpathy have found it more comparable to O1 Pro and R1. So think of them as maybe one step behind V3 and Claude 3.5 Sonnet. Other early testing has shown that it does have relatively higher hallucination rates, but it is extremely fast, which is a key strength. And it is stronger in real-time search given its real-time access to platforms like Twitter. It's also more easy to jailbreak and sometimes very verbose in its responses. What we're seeing here is that XAI is relying on brute force versus cutting edge training techniques as seen by their massive supercomputer initiative. So in all, Grok definitely has strengths and can be used for certain use cases, but it's not necessarily the clear leader right now. Elsewhere in the model world, Sam Altman kind of teased their roadmap for what they have coming down the line with GPT 4.5 and GPT 5. They basically acknowledge that the current model lineup is kind of confusing and what they want is for AI to just work for users without requiring manual model selection, meaning that right now for a lot of users, it can be confusing not to know the difference between GPT 4 versus O3, what's a reasoning model, what's not. And in the future, what they really want to push is instead of a model picker, which requires users knowing the difference between lots of different models and types of models, they're hoping to create a unified system or at least a unified UX that knows which tools to use for which kinds of questions. So if you're asking something that requires more reasoning or a STEM-based question, it'll tap into a reasoning model automatically for you. They say that GPT 4.5 Orion will be its next release, which is the last non-chain of thought model, meaning it's the last model that won't inherently perform structured reasoning the way that newer models like O3 and O1 do. And it's very clear that the general sense in the field again is that the future isn't just about making these models bigger with more compute and more data, but rather that future improvements will come from stuff further down the pipeline, including things like chain of thought. What's also interesting is if we think about AI as this unit of intelligence, ChatGPT in the future is likely going to price it accordingly. So as opposed to pricing it by different models like O3, GPT-4, et cetera, what they're going to do is categorize it really by intelligence. So pro tier giving you access to GPT-5 or even higher levels of intelligence, plus tier at GPT-5, free tier at standard intelligence. So interesting to think about how they're already categorizing and pricing intelligence accordingly. A lot of the big frontier labs have also recently launched a big push towards deep research so with Perplexity becoming the latest AI company to release an in-depth research tool, which was announced, I think, two Fridays ago now. Google has also unveiled a similar feature for its Gemini AI platform in, back in December. And then OpenAI just earlier this month launched its own research agent as well. 
And all three companies have actually given the feature the same name, Deep Research. With all of these, the goal is to provide a more in-depth answer with real citations for more professional use cases compared to what you get from you know, the back and forth that you get from a consumer chatbot. What's special about Perplexity's deep research offering is that it actually is able to perform deep research much more quickly, and it can often complete tasks in almost under three minutes, and you can access this in Perplexity right now compared to when you use OpenAI's deep research, you need a $200 a month pro subscription, and it often takes anywhere from five to 30 minutes on OpenAI's deep research. Another really big push is also what happens when you sequence and chunk deep research with multi-agent systems. So Google has just launched their AI co-scientist, which is built on Gemini 2.0, and it can help researchers generate hypotheses, summarize literature, can even propose experiments. And the system is actually based on a multi-agent collaboration. So different AI agents are specializing in different things like hypothesis generation, evolution, meta review, so on. Um, and AI co-scientists actually successfully proposed novel drug discoveries even very recently. And just a really big, exciting push towards this broader trend towards multi-agent AI systems. For companies that are building globally, Mistral launched Saba, a 24 billion parameter AI model created by Mistral that's specifically tailored for Middle Eastern and South Asian regions. It's designed to excel in Arabic communication, but also performs really well in languages originating from South India as well. It's specifically custom trained on data sets from those regions and therefore designed for specific cultures and linguistics to understand regional parlance. What's interesting is that with this, Mistral is really positioning itself as this kind of strong international alternative to US and Chinese AI giants. And we're probably going to see the rise of more and more of these local regional models as well. Finally, a really cool report from OpenAI coming out recently on student adoption around ChatGPT. What they're finding is that over one third of US college age students, 18 to 24, are using ChatGPT. And over 25% of their messages are related to learning, tutoring, and schoolwork. Key use cases including things like starting papers and projects, summarizing text, revising writing, brainstorming. However, adoption isn't equal across all states, and you're seeing the highest adoption in states like California, New Jersey, New York, Arizona, Washington, Virginia. And from the student end, 75% of students want to incorporate AI in their education and careers. It'll be really cool to continue to track all of this and see how students continue to interface with this new technology in this very quickly evolving time. And that's it for this week. If you have any questions, please feel free to ping us and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.